Hey guys, it's Richard from Official Auto Channel and Reefs.com and today is actually one day before hurricane and I'm out here in Plant City, Florida to visit my good friend Chris Meckley of ACI Aquaculture to talk about some corals. Check it out. Hello everybody. My name is Chris Meckley from ACI Aquaculture. Um, we're looking forward to doing this uh, short video here with Richard um, on Euphilia. <laughs> So this is going to be exciting to talk about euphelias. Everybody loves euphelias. They're, they're absolutely gorgeous. There's so many different color morphs of them. And it's really interesting because the family Euphelia Day has been broken down into more genuses. So we have Catalophilia, we have Euphelia, and there's really only one species of Euphelia from what I've learned. Um, I could be wrong. I know that a lot has been changing um, regularly, but um, the only true Euphelia species from what I remember reading is Euphelia glabrescens, which everybody knows and everybody loves is the infamous torch coral. They are absolutely gorgeous. They come in so many different color morphs. I have a customer that actually has over 38 different color morphs of Euphelia glabrescens in his display aquarium. And then you have, um, what we used to know as euphelia is now called fimbrophilia, which is the majority of every other one. Well, actually, it is every other one. So you have, uh, now it's fimbrophilia divisa, which is commonly known as the wall divisa, or the big solid heads. Then you have the fimbrophilia ancora, which is wall hammer coral. And we've learned a lot about what we used to think was Ancora. I'll break that down here in a little bit. And then you have Euphelia paraancora, which is branching hammer coral. Then we have Fimbrophilia paradivisa, which is branching frog spawn. And there is a lot of different color morphs of that that um, I'm seeing since uh, we've got Indonesian corals back. There's color morphs I've never seen of that particular coral. And uh, that's the exciting part for me. Um, when you think you've seen it all, you get thrown for a loop. And um, that's why I love what I do on a daily basis. Uh, then you have Fimb Fimbrophilia cristata. I'm pretty sure it is Fimbrophilia. That is the only one that I'm questioning myself on whether or not it was uh, reclassified as Fimbrophilia or not, even though it's very uncommon in the industry. And we also have you know, my friend Vincent Bale or Chales from uh, Bali Aquarium um, has the new holy grail, his new holy grail, which is uh, Fimbrophilia baliensis which is, um, we've been getting it in. Um, not in large numbers, but it's, uh, when you look at it, it kind of looks like a branching hammer coral, but it's literally, the branches are, as, the maximum is about the size of this pen. Um, and when they open up from this little itty bitty head, you know, they get to be about the size of a, of a quarter to a 50 cent piece. Um, so if you ever see something that somebody is calling, you know, you feel the, paraancora or branching hammer coral or fimbrophilia paraancora, it's actually, um, when they're super thin like that, it's actually more than likely it is um, uh, the new species of called baliensis. We have gotten it in green, we've gotten it in gold, we've gotten it in orange, and we've gotten it in uh, kind of a yellowish color. Very, very nice looking corals. We actually um, kept a bunch of them uh, for the farm. I'd love to see how fast they grow. Uh, but the, I guess the bottom line with Euphelia Day as a um, family of corals, um, and, as, and with all coral uh, families, they're changing constantly as we've gone through process of using DNA and even more advanced. My friend over in Australia, Don Gilson, was telling me all of the euphelias or fimbrophilias that they've sent to the Australian Marine Institute of Science to do DNA analysis on. We, we get them in as, from there as euphelia and cora because they have not adopted all the new scientific d names and analysis of these corals as a known because they're still learning about them and they don't want to release all of this information until it is actually concrete. But what they did find, which is very interesting to me, and uh, we get so many different color morphs of Australian Ancora, which was the wall hammer. It comes in as Euphelia Ancora, and I've gotten some colonies in that were massive. Um, Richard, I don't know if you've seen them here 
I think I've shown them in, in videos and pictures. It just blows my mind how big these things get. Turning out that most all of them that have different colors are actually different species, which is so amazing to me. And that means there's hundreds of species that we thought were one are being broken down even farther because of the nuclear DNA that they're doing for the scientific studies on um, all the different genuses of corals that are out there. So it's uh, what we know is changing constantly, which is awesome and it's amazing and keeps me on my toes. I understand that misconception when you deal with, you know, wall euphelias do not ship well, neither do any euphelia in general. Misconception of wall euphelias being an issue. I learned a long time ago that when, in, when Australian corals were coming to me, you know, I used to get really upset with the supplier I was using, you know, because I get all these wall euphelias and they would all be chopped up into pieces and I'm like, whoa, you can't do this. And they laughed at me. What do you mean you can't do this? We do it all the time. Our colonies are so big, we can't ship them to you. We don't have these little perfect little colonies that you know you're used to getting. We get these big colonies. If we were to go through and try to find the perfect little colonies, we'd never collect any corals because they're so abundant when they find them that they try to find smaller pieces. They don't want to take these jumbo pieces that are bigger than a desk sitting next to me because then that makes it even more difficult to, you know, they got to cut, cut them down even farther. So they, you know, they collect colonies that are like this big, but they break them down into manageable sized pieces so that we, they can export them and feel comfortable putting them into a bag. So back to again to Indo and what happened, you know, with the 48 exporters and the reason why Indo Indonesian wall euphelias were such a problem for so long was because of the fact that there was a demand for them that was so high that the, the, from the collection point to the exporters, you know, they were getting collected within a few days. They were put in, being put into a box and being shipped over to the um, city where they're exported from. And then they're sitting there for not even a week before they were exported again. So these corals would get stressed from being collected from the reef, even though they're healthy when they get to the facility. They get then stressed being put into a box a few days later for a day in a, you know, or maybe only 12 hours, still in a little amount of water. So they're stressed out from that. Then they're put into another facility and they're not sitting there long enough and able to recover from the possibilities of being, you know, the, the tissue being torn or whatnot. So they're not as healthy and you put them in a box and ship them over to us two days, two and a half days in a box and they either come in looking good, they come in dead or they come in rough. And I don't want the dead part. The rough part doesn't bother me because we love what we do and we take care of the corals. And I'm so happy about that because I can ship these things all over the country and make so many customers happier because of the fact that we actually are maintaining and keeping these corals healthy. My live video I did just a few, you know, a half an hour ago, I got corals that came in on Thursday. Ain't nobody getting them. I'm not gonna send them to anybody. I don't care if they're a curbside pickup customer. I'm not boxing it up until it's been here for a minimum of a week. Most people have no clue what a euphelia, a fimbrophilia and cora looks like as it's growing. Um, a true colony that's an adult colony that's this big around, you can see where the center is. And it's usually an area that's about this big and a colony that's about this big. And then there's kind of branches coming off of it, but I call it a maze because as it grows off of there, as the colony grows from that central point and grows up, these walls grow out. And then at the ends of those walls, they kind of fan out a little bit. It's really, really, really amazing. They're, they're just beautiful and it's just amazing how, you know, these animals grow in the wild and then they just cut those things into pieces and I've gotten the centers where they're like this big and there's like seven maize branches that came off of them and you can see where my supplier just cut the whole thing around it. All those branches or, or mazes that came off of there got cut into manageable pieces so that of course, you know, they can make what they need to make because they have a quota system over there in tons. So they can you know, maximize the amount of money that they can make to keep their business going so that we can continue to get these amazing animals over here. And it's a minimal impact when you break it down. When you have a, uh, an area that's 50 acres of nothing but euphelia, 
I really, how much can you take off it before you even notice there's anything gone from it? I mean, 10 years, 20 years, um, unless there's people out there doing unscrupulous things, which unfortunately, in every type of industry there is that, we just don't, I personally don't support it. I see it, I know it, and I cut it out immediately. Um, but bottom line, people should not be afraid of wall euphelias if they're buying them from somebody that actually cares about the corals when they purchase them. I've learned a long time ago that doing coral washes and dips with euphilias is very, very touch and go. They are very sensitive and I don't do any dipping other than iodine dipping on euphilias. Any euphilia day. So if you talk about iodine dipping, then I guess there's like a bucket of like, you know, tank water and then drops of a little bit of uh, Lugol's Correct. iodine. Correct. And just, just you know, like a little ba bathe. Exactly. That water. It's like when I was a kid, and, and Richard, I'm sure you remember this too. I mean, my mom used to have the mercurochrome in the closet. When I got a cut, it went, oh, okay. mercurochrome went on it. Now, kids nowadays have no idea what that feels like, but um, it needs to come back in my opinion. <laughs> um, it's basically the same thing when, you, when, when a coral has damage to it and it's not happy and not healthy and you can see the damage on like, uh, especially on uh, any uh, euphilia that has tissue going down the, the wall or the branch of the, of the coral skeleton. And again, when you get the coral, there should be some tissue coming down from where the top of the, where the polyp, where the end, the end of the, where the coral lights are. If there's no tissue, you know, even if it only comes down an eighth of an inch or less, as long as you see tissue, you know that that coral is okay in most cases. But if it was an aquacultured coral, you'll see tissue down the skeleton fairly far, an inch to two inches, depending on how big the, the fragment is. If there's damage in that, you know, we, we take them and dip them in an iodine solution. So my rule of thumb is I used to go by different remedies and um, I'm just been doing it for so long that I do a white bucket. That is key, a white bucket. Don't use a green bucket, black bucket. You'll never see what I'm talking about. Take Lugol solution if you have one small fragment, you know, say it's a small fragment, you know, like this big. If your bucket's this big around and say you put that much water, it covers the fragment. You put enough Lugol solution in that white bucket to make it look kind of like Arizona green tea. Anybody knows what Arizona green tea is? It kind of has that slight brownish, tannish tint to it. And about 10 to 15 minutes, I go 10 minutes on euphelias and I go 15 minutes on a lot of your large polyp stony corals, such as um, anything in the Favia family, the, um, the Musidae's, like um, Micromusa, um, Acans. Um, I usually do about 15 minutes on something like that, and um, I usually do 15 minutes on Acros and Montes and other SPS corals as well. Euphelia days tends to be a little bit more sensitive, I thought, to the tea dip. That's been a good remedy for us. It's not perfect, but it definitely helps because the iodine does sterilize any infection that possibly is setting in on that cut and it doesn't hurt to do it more than once. You know, do it every day for a couple of uh, days just to ensure because if I get a cut when I was a kid, my mom put my career chrome on it for three days in a row and the same thing can be done with your coral fragment. It's not going to hurt it. It's only going to benefit it and keep it from um, bacteria from spreading and, and, and killing the coral. Brown jelly disease, 90, I, I'm gonna say this, and you can, anybody can argue with me up and down, I'm open for debate on this. I've been doing this a long time, I've seen brown jelly hit, and honestly, I haven't seen brown jelly in a long time. And the only time I see brown jelly on any of my corals that we have in here is within a day or two after shipping from overseas. And I will guarantee anybody this the biggest contributor to brown jelly disease is cheap titration test kits for alkalinity when you when you're as a hobbyist you have a digital reader or a titration kit again these companies do an amazing job all of them i'm not i'm not i'm not calling anybody out I'm not saying they got bad products on the market. All I'm saying is they're not accurate products. And I understand why, and hobbyists need to understand why too. If they're gonna be affordable for a hobbyist to be able to use them, they have to do what they have to do to make them as close to 
true readings as possible and in, and in all honesty it's impossible for them to do it in the price points that they have to keep them at so that hobbyists can afford them so that you guys can monitor your aquariums with that being said they all do a great job at giving you consistency consistency is key so if you know where how far they're off that's where you fix your problem hobbyists if you have a test kit, a titration kit, and you have been told to keep your alkalinity at 8.3 to 8.6, and you're using one of these titration kits, um, again, I'm not gonna name the names of these companies. Um, the information can be found. Um, I've discussed it with Jake. I've discussed it with um, my friend Richard here, um, and I would be happy to answer a PM. Um, because these companies that make these titration kits are doing a great thing for you as hobbyists. You just need to be informed of where they are off and I can help you with that. But Euphelia and Brown Jelly, I'm telling you it is alkalinity 100, not 100%, in the 90s, 90, 95%. It is all alkalinity problems um, because they, just over the years I've just learned that because it's been, Experience says a lot, they say. Well, that's the experience that I've, re that I've seen and noticed. And um, 25 years of experience, I think that um, it speaks volumes. Um, you can't tell me that the coral came in super duper healthy and everything else in your tank is perfectly fine. And it's the only euphelia in there and your alkaline is at 8.4 and my, only my euphelia died. It's your alkalinity, guarantee you. So when you have a euphelia that's doing amazing in your aquarium for years and you've watched it grow from a single fragment, a single head into a multi-branch head and then all of a sudden you have this one head out of the whole entire colony that decides it's not happy anymore. Well, here's a checklist. Check one, what is your alkalinity? Is it stable? Is your test kit old? Two, did you add any new fish? Is that new fish, if you did, is that new fish possibly a nipper? Did he take a bite out of it? When you fed your tank, the coral caught something, went down and took a bite out of, the, out of the, the polyp, and the polyp is stressed and not opening because of that. If it doesn't reopen in a few days, because usually they heal fairly quickly, you know, I would look at possibly another, another issue. Three, is there a bad crab or anything like that that's in there irritating it at nighttime? Four, has it grown so much that it is now getting too much flow? That's another thing that happens, and I've seen it happen with euphelias, uh, euphelias especially, is as they're growing in, you know, normally they tend to steer away from it when it gets too much flow, they'll redirect their growth pattern. I've seen it with acros, I've seen it with a lot of different corals, but that is something that if you change the direction of your flow in your aquarium by one of your power heads, that could have caused that particular head not to open because it's just getting way too much. And of course, we all know euphelias, they like their flow, they don't like that jet like you know that real heavy nasty flow like the SPS do but they do love to flap back and forth and blow around in the current if you move your power head or the flow or got new power heads in your system new wave pumps you know is the, is the current too strong in that particular area where that head is another thing to check for is is, is metals um, you know is there something leaching into your system um, why it would only affect one particular head I don't know but that is uh, always in the realm of possibilities. You know, are your nutrient levels creeping up on you and you don't realize it? I've seen, seen euphelias actually completely lose their heads when somebody has a tank that's got nitrates through the roof and you know, they have euphelia heads floating around their aquarium and they wonder if they're ever gonna reattach. Well, more than likely, no. But it, I have seen it happen where they do start to calcify again and regrow a skeleton, but that's only been one in instance. <laughs> Polyp bailout is a stress reaction to uh, conditions in your aquarium that are not favorable for the coral, so it can't go anywhere, so it bails its polyp and hope that the current's gonna take it somewhere where it is favorable for it. And um, so that's that's another possibility. But I said metals a little bit ago, and that, and that could be from, you know, pumps. Um, it could be from, um, you know, uh, impure um, um, additives. Um, it could be from um, over adding trace minerals. Um, you know, anybody using an algae scrubber, if you are dosing traces on top of it, you know, you need to get that, find, find out where you are by sending out an ICP every once in a while to make sure you don't have certain traces and, and metals that are rising too high because, you know, there's a reason why the ocean only has, well, 
The reason is, is Mother Nature put it that way, but there's a reason why we don't want those levels to go above natural seawater in most cases. And if we do, what effects do they have on our corals? And what would, is it possible to affect one head out of an entire colony? I, I believe it is, because it could be that that head is stressed from something else, but you're not noticing it, but because those other levels are higher and the other stress factors aren't affecting the rest of the colony, the stress that that other piece is getting, plus the high metals, it can cause that head to stress and die. Um, and everything else be perfectly fine, but it could cause problems for the rest of it eventually too. But you wouldn't even know that was it is. So bottom line, you know, I can't give anybody a straight up real concrete answer in competence as to what is causing something like that to happen to a single head out of a colony. I can give you as many scenarios that I possibly know, and I'm open for discussion on anybody that has other possibilities and other answers for the reason why these things happen, because it's not just hobbyists that are having it, it's farmers like myself. We have the same things happen. Do we figure it out sometimes? Yes. Did I give you some scenarios? Yes. Um, are there many more out there that I've never even heard of? I'm sure there is, and I'm, that's why I love talking to people about it, because um, the more I know, um, the more it helps me as a farmer to eliminate and stop and you know the possibilities of the issues that other people have come up with and hobbyists in my opinion are um, like the branch of a scientific laboratory that nobody ever talks about because they really don't look at them as a scientific laboratory but in reality they are even though they don't have credentials because they actually are you know, trying to figure out their problems as well. And I wish science and freaking hobby would come together one day and we'd all should actually be able to take each other's information and put it together. But of course, you know, that's gonna be a long way off and we'll see if it ever happens. But um, that would be the best thing that ever happened for um, the coral reefs around the world, in my opinion. Um, let's just pray that one day it does happen. That's what Charlie Varon said at Macklin two years ago. And I, it sticks with me. I was there, I listened to it. I heard him, you know, Charlie Varon said, uh, that exact, those exact words, and um, he's right. An aquarium, you can put fabias next to each other, as long as they're really fabias, and not fabia favites. You know, and they can live really close in harmony and they're not gonna whack and kill each other, in most cases, because they're the same genus. But with Euphelia glabrescens or torch coral, they can live in harmony with, you know, Paradivisa, Paraancora, all the branching varieties of Euphelia, and they can live in harmony for eh, months, in some cases years. But it's just like, you know, survival of the fittest, you know, you've got your strongest corals, and then you've got some that are weaker. And it comes to find that I'm gonna guess that the strongest or fastest growing is the Euphelia glabrescens. So when they get to the point where they're happy and they're living with your in your Euphelia garden, which again, don't put torches with your frog spawns and hammers because this will happen down the road. You will have a torch coral that will whack a frog spawn next to it or a hammer next to it. And honestly, it's it can go the other way too. I've seen where the other, you, you know, you feel is that will hurt the torch coral. But in I would say most cases, you're gonna have a torch coral that's gonna kill a coral next to it, and you're gonna be like, ah. So I would say if you wanna have your beautiful little Euphelia garden, which I think is awesome, because um, watching them intertwine and grow over the years would be amazing, because I'm sure that they would grow in between each other. It's gonna be nice to see what happens. This has kind of been a trend for what, the last, what, two years, Richard? And, and nobody's really got any colonies that have grown enough to see if they, you know, that frag of, green frog spawn next to the frag of orange frog spawn as they grow are the branches going to go this way and this way and you're going to have all of a sudden all these intertwining branches of red or of orange and green or green tip that's going to look really really cool i can't wait to see what happens but keep your torches your glabrescence on their own rock and keep your you know frog spawns and hammers they can go together i've never seen one of those two hurt each other and in, in, in all the years that we've been doing this i've never seen one kill the other um, and I attribute that to the fact that there probably are the same genus, Fimbrophilia versus Euphelia. Um, so if you want a zoo garden, or a zoo garden, uh, a Euphelia garden, 
Only rule I say to give is keep your euphilia torch, your torch corals separate from your frog spawns and your hammers, so that way your torches don't get mad one day and kill your hammers and frog spawns, or the possibility of that happening vice versa. Um, and there's so many different color morphs of, um, of uh, glabrescence out there, I didn't even realize it. I think my one customer, I think he said he's got 38 different color morphs of um, glabrescence now, and um, I just, it blows me up, blows my mind. I got some more in uh, on Wednesday and I described them to me. He's like, I don't have them. He's like, gotta have one head for my gardens. So <laughs> it's gonna be awesome to see that tank as it grows in. I just hope it all does well and we don't have fighting because I hope they are really truly the same genus or the same species for sure so that they aren't um, killing each other in time. Um, so bottom line, enjoy your euphilias and group them together in a garden all you want and it's gonna look amazing. Something that is a misconception um, on euphilias, uh, they love to capture food in the water and where they live in the wild is um, quote unquote dirty water. It's a misconception again, I think I've said it in multiple other videos, Richard. Um, they come from um, water that is very silty, meaning the currents can be, can be extremely strong and upwellings for say. So if there is an upwelling that comes in that has got a real strong current that's stirring up the bottom down deep, when that comes up, that current might not be as strong where the euphilias are actually living, but it makes that water look dirty. In reality, that's food. That just means these corals are feeding constantly. So one of the things I love to do, I usually do it on Fridays. I usually like to take and get my PE mysis pellets and stick them in my, uh, in my little feed bucket with some uh, reef roids and some calanus and uh, go around and feed. And it's so awesome to shut the flow down and watch your euphilias grab the, the pellets and the, and, the, and the calanus and just draw it into their bodies. Euphilias need to be fed, folks. It's uh, something that I recommend you do. If you want them to grow fast, they will grow much faster by giving them the extra nutrients that they need by feeding them. They'll live and do extremely fine just with the zooxanthellae that lives in their tissue that feeds the coral itself. They will live and thrive and grow for many, many years, but they will not grow nearly as fast. If you want them to grow faster, feed them once a week, twice a week, three times a week. If you're crazy, like we are and you've got the right nutrient export on your aquarium, feed them every day. But you gotta make sure you know what you're doing when it comes to that, because overfeeding your tank is the problem. You cannot overfeed your corals or your fish. You can overfeed your tank. And the proper nutrient export is very key. I recommend clear water scrubbers. That's me, I just hate adding chemicals. That's a never ending expense. The scrubber is a one time shot deal other than the traces you have to add, which is a minute expense compared to the cost of GFO and aluminum oxide or whatever else is a way of nutrient export for phosphates and, and of course nitrates. Feed your euphilias. I want to thank you for joining us here. My name is Chris Meckley from ACI Aquaculture. I hope you enjoyed this uh, short video on uh, euphilias, um, the hot, one of the hobbyist favorite genus slash species of corals. My name is Chris Meckley. I'm out.